So before you leave, yeah, it's really good to be here. The, uh, uh, calling what I'm about to tell you uh, exponential medicine is a huge compliment. I'm going to be telling you about a field that is truly in its infancy, perhaps even gestational. And speaking of infancy, uh, there's Daniel, a uh, good friend of ours, uh, Mandy Slater, and myself. That is unbelievably embarrassing. There's been a lot of discussion about medical education today. There's a step before that, which is the pre-medical education. And uh, this is, I remember these days well in the Berkshires, studying hard and uh, you look good. I'll get you back later. All right, thanks. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, again, what a real privilege to, uh, to be here, and I'm uh, going to have a lot of fun, I hope, telling you about uh, this field of brain-computer interfaces or uh, neural interfaces. The, uh, I am going to tell you about an ongoing pilot clinical trial. Click. And uh, because it's an ongoing trial, it's important that I mention my financial disclosures. <laughs> the, um, now, there's a lot of you here who can help me to solve that problem, and uh, I hope that you'll come and grab me afterwards so we can do that. Um, I am quite grateful, though, to the uh, number of federal agencies and philanthropies that have continued to support the research that I'm about to tell you about, uh, including the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, we just uh, heard from Mr. Littlefield as well. The um, uh, most important disclosure by far, though, are the great group of people that I get to work with every day uh, across a whole host of fields, neurology, neurosurgery, neuroengineering, uh, physics, applied mathematics. Uh, and as is uh, often the case, you should ignore the faces that you see on this slide because it's all the folks whose names are on the right uh, that really did uh, all of the research. <laughs> so uh, as Daniel mentioned, I do spend some of my time as a neurointensivist, so I'd like to start with a clinical vignette. In uh, 1996, there was a 42-year-old woman with no significant past medical history, uh, who was living outside Metro Boston. And uh, she was in her garden, in her tomato garden. She got a little bit dizzy. And then she came inside and she sat on the couch next to her 10-year-old son. She got a little bit more dizzy. And then suddenly she couldn't move the left side of her body. And then she couldn't move the right side of her body. And then she couldn't speak. She went to a hospital near her. And about 12 hours later, she came over to Mass General. Uh, that was about the first year where uh, MRI was being used, at least diffusion-weighted imaging. Uh, MRI was being used for acute stroke. And uh, this was the MRI that she had. And uh, we don't need to turn uh, many of you into neuroradiologists uh, at the moment. Uh, but all I can tell you that you need to know is that gray is good and white is bad. Most of her brain was gray, except for that one part that you see there on the left, right in the middle, uh, that was bright white. Now, when she came from the outside hospital, as it's known, over to MGH. She was reported to be in a coma, that is, uh, not awake, not alert, unable to appreciate anything. Um, but one of my future teachers, who was then a junior neurology resident, Anish Sengal, uh, had the good thought to uh, ask her to look up as she was laying on a stretcher in the emergency room, and she did, and then looked down, and she did, indicating that she wasn't comatose at all. She was awake and alert, and she could hear everything, and she could feel everything, but she couldn't move, and she couldn't speak. I'd ask you for just a moment to imagine being in that condition. It's for people like her, and for people whose neurologic injuries or illnesses might not be quite so dramatic, that we're hoping as a field that we can develop technologies that restore communication, and restore mobility, and restore independence. Now, this story will get a little bit happier. There she is. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this field of brain-computer interfaces, in part uh, through her story, through her eyes. Uh, let me skip ahead a little bit first. Uh, as an uh, academic, uh, I and the rest of us in the field treasure uh, peer-reviewed research. We've heard quite, about that, quite a bit about that over the uh, course of the day. So I'd like to play you uh, one uh, eminent scientist who uh, conducted a peer review of this field a few years ago, and uh, this is what he had to say. Once in a while, we run across a science story that's hard to believe until you see it. That's how we felt about this story when we first saw human beings operating computers, writing emails, and driving wheelchairs with nothing but their thoughts. Quietly, in a number of laboratories, an astounding technology is developing 
that directly connects the human brain to a computer. It's like a sudden leap in human evolution, a leap that could one day help paralyzed people to walk again and amputees to move bionic limbs. As you will see tonight, the connection has already been made for a few people, and for them, it has been life-changing. Uh, I realize that if several of you are online at the moment. If you go to the Merriam-Webster online dictionary and look up hyperbole and click, that is the video that will play. Um, uh, I appreciate his optimism. Uh, that wasn't quite the state of affairs in 2008 when he reported on it, but he did capture what we all hope will be the future, hopefully exponentially so, of this field of brain-computer interfaces. And now let me take a few steps back and describe this a little bit more. If we think about somebody like the woman whose MRI you just saw who's had a brainstem stroke, awake and alert, can't move, can't speak, or any number of illnesses and injuries, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have had these illnesses or injuries who often can't move and sometimes also can't speak, but who are otherwise completely cognitively intact. And the assistive technologies that we have available today to help people with any of these injuries or illnesses are only modestly effective at best. Now, we've heard about some of the genetic pharmacotherapy, biotherapeutics that are uh, coming online, that we continue to research on. Those are all very important. But if we think about this illness or injury, we can think about the intention to move as starting somewhere in the brain and in cartoon form, finding its way down to the brainstem spinal cord. And all of these injuries and illnesses can be thought of just as a big red X. A lot of the ongoing research is focused on fixing that X right uh, wherever it may be. But another approach is to create what is essentially a patch cord. What if we could tap in to that desire to move one's limb, that desire to move? and reroute it back to the place that it was supposed to be, maybe to moving a computer cursor or some other effector. And it's that concept of being able to re-enable this turning thought into action that's at the heart of the brain-computer interface field. So uh, this, again, is exponential medicine. Uh, this was a new idea in 1968. So uh, again, this is really a field in its infancy. That's when Carl Frank, the guy in the middle there who had just opened up a lab at the uh, NINDB, the precursor to NINDS, and uh, there's his quote, uh, we'll be engaged in the development of principles and techniques by which information from the nervous system can be used to control devices such as prosthetic devices, communications equipment, teleoperators, and ultimately, which was the big win in 1968, uh, perhaps even computers. Uh, we're making some progress, so Long before the exponential curve up, there's that nearly flat part. And hopefully, as a field, we've gotten past that flat part and we're just at the beginning of making some more progress. So uh, again, not quite sure we're exponential, but we're getting close. Brain-computer interfaces, neural interfaces, BCIs, BMIs, brain-machine interfaces, whenever you hear about them, there are many different types. I'll tell you about one, uh, but all of these have three major components, a neural sensor, a decoder, and an assistive technology. I'm a neurologist, so that's a person, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, when I think about that person, or I think about one of my patients who's unable to move, uh, I wonder how can we extract that desire, for example, to move one's hand? Well, if we want to do that, we've got to record some type of signal from the brain. There's lots of signals to choose from. There's electrical signals, which I'll focus on. There's, of course, chemical signals. There's signals that are related to blood flow that represent the underlying metabolic activity. Uh, we can think about what area or areas of the brain we might want to record from. Do we want to record from one or a couple or a dozen? Uh, there are at least a dozen areas in the happy, healthy monkey, that is the rhesus monkey, and I'll come back and. Uh, talk about monkeys in just a moment, the, uh, that are related to the control of voluntary movement. So do we want to record from some of them or all of them or maybe just one? And with those questions answered, then we choose a sensor. After answering all those questions, we've got our signal in our hands, and then we put it into a black box. And that black box is the home. My colleagues in computational neuroscience, who I think may have the most fun job in the world, which is to figure out what all of these signals in the brain mean. What is encoded, for example, in the firing rate of an individual neuron, or in the changes in the larger potentials of the brain? And not only encoding what's in there, but then finding a decoder, finding the math. By the way, is anybody here a computational neuroscientist? No, good, because I just reduced your entire livelihood to the letter A. The, um, so I'm going to get away with that. That's good. The, uh, hopefully, after choosing the right decoder, which is an important focus of the field, we can then allow somebody who can't move their hand 
to be able to control some external device again. But before we leave the bench, we have to think, what is it that we want this technology to do? What should a BCI do to help somebody with, for example, paralysis? Well, for the woman who we just met, if we could restore her ability to type on a keyboard, on a laptop, to browse the internet for education, entertainment, to control her immediate environment, something simple as next 10. If we think about somebody with cervical spinal cord injury, another disconnection of a perfectly working brain from an otherwise perfectly working body. Uh, perhaps better control over one's wheelchair would be helpful. There have been some, including at this conference, that have proposed, or proposed the uh, creation of semi-autonomous robots that could help with activities of daily living. Wouldn't it be great if we could just will those into action? Uh, I spent some of my time with the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Center for Neurorestoration and Neurotechnology in Providence, and there have been some great prosthetic limbs that have been created over the past five, ten years uh, to help our veterans who are returning home with limb loss. Even the best of those prosthetic limbs today that are available, the controllers for them are quite simple. So one, the DECA arm, which I'll show you in a little while, uh, best controller available today is some accelerometers that are put in the foot. So you might wiggle your left shoe, for example, to control your right prosthetic arm. Wouldn't it be better if you could just think about moving that right arm? Maybe robotic limbs to help uh, people with paralysis. Uh, but one of the real dreams for this technology is to one day reconnect brain to limb, to take these powerful signals, intuitive signals, out of the brain, root them down through an electronic nervous system, uh, to stimulating technologies that can reanimate limb movement. Another important use for this is an adjunct to ongoing neurorehabilitation and, uh, and neural repair. So, if you remember nothing else, those are the slides uh, that represent the, uh, the field of, of BCI. Uh, where did this field start? Well, it uh, started more than 50 years ago by taking single tungsten electrodes, placing them into the brain of animals that were performing sometimes different tasks, and that amplified waveform, that static, uh, to me, is Mozart. Uh, that is the firing away of the action potentials of a single neuron in the brain. And if we can understand that staccato rat -a tat tat and what's encoded, the information that's in there, then we can understand the language of the nervous system. And if we can do that, then we may be able to extract that information to allow somebody with paralysis to control an external device or perhaps in the future uh, their own limbs again. This is one of my colleagues from grad school. Uh, he and I spent a lot of time together, and uh, the reason he's up there is uh, really to represent that half century or so. It turns out that it's fairly straightforward to teach a happy, healthy monkey to play video games. You put him in a chair, you put his hand on a joystick, and as long as you've come up with the right cocktail, he gets a squirt of juice each time he does the right task. Uh, this particular animal liked one-third applesauce, one-third apple juice, and one-third water. Maybe wondering why I'm telling you that. It took about six weeks of my PhD pursuit to figure that out. So I feel compelled to share it with you. Um, after he started hopping in the chair, playing the task, and playing video games for hours on end, legions of scientists have recorded from different parts of the brain to understand how those different parts are involved in the control of voluntary movement. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead reducing what we know about one part of the brain, learned over about 50 years to a post-it note, the, uh, this is the M1, or the primary motor cortex, right about here or so. Very important for the control of voluntary limb movement. And it turns out that there are a lot of different variables of moving one's hand that are encoded in those firing rates. The force, imagine if I'm squeezing on a joystick, there's probably some brain activity that's increasing. Uh, there's this concept of a preferred direction that if an animal or a person moves their hand to the right, there are some neurons that are firing on the opposite side of the brain a little bit more quickly, and uh, they decrease their firing rate if the hand moves in the other direction. Uh, this is the result of, as I said, lots of laboratories, really fundamental, publicly funded research over decades, uh, and some of the PIs listed there uh, at the bottom. Uh, also, just for the aficionado, it's important to point out that it's not just action potentials that have uh, information in them, uh, but there's lots of other electrical signals in the brain that can be recorded simultaneously. But it takes I don't know, about two, two and a half hours of listening to one neuron as an animal moves his hand in various directions to try to figure out what that neuron does. And one neuron at a time is a laborious, slow, far from exponential way to learn about the nervous system. So what was needed was a better technology that would allow us to record from at least dozens of cells simultaneously. 
And thankfully, in the uh, early 1990s, Dick Norman of the University of Utah uh, created uh, that array, uh, known originally as the Utah Array, subsequently as the CyberConnects Array, the BrainGate Array, the BlackRock Array. Four by four millimeters, there it is on the head of a US penny. And as a reminder, if you look, uh, nail on your little finger and divide it into about quarters, one of those quarters is probably about four by four millimeters. And each of those can hold 96 active recording sites, which can then get tapped into the top of the brain, allowing us to record from dozens or maybe 100 or more individual neurons at once. So skip ahead a little bit. Animal playing a video game, recording from part of the brain important for movement, building one of these decoders that essentially builds a map between the animal's actual hand movement and the brain activity that's happening at the same time that's controlling that hand movement. And then you play a small trick on the animal, which is to disconnect the joystick. Now, just another pause. Anybody here have the opportunity to work with non-human primates, with monkeys? Well, a couple, yes. So uh, for the rest of you, um, if you happen to be doing this, be careful when you disconnect the joystick. <laughs> monkeys have been perfectly happy getting their applesauce, apple juice, water cocktail, suddenly get a little frustrated and give you a dirty look because the cursor that they were controlling with the joystick in their hand uh, doesn't seem to work quite as well anymore. As we play this video again, what's happening here from John Donahue's lab in the uh, early 2000s, Misha Sarai, an MD, PhD student at the time, the cursor no longer is being controlled by the animal's hand, it's now being control controlled directly, if you will, through brain power. The decoded real-time intention to move as the animal's hand sometimes is just resting there uh, on the chair. This in 2002, published in Nature, was the first demonstration of two-dimensional real-time control and closed loop of a cursor uh, simply by thinking about it, if you will, uh, by this uh, kind of happy, healthy monkey and several other labs that uh, uh, soon thereafter uh, were performing similar and continuing to expand on this research. And that became a spin-off from the Brown University lab uh, to uh, what was then a company, Cyberkinetics, now back in academia. And the question based on that proof of concept was not whether this 50 years of research was going to allow monkeys to play video games with their mind. That was not the goal. Uh, the goal was to find out whether we might be able to help people with paralysis using a similar approach. So now in our pilot clinical trials of the BrainGate Neural Interface System going on for a little over 10 years, uh, that same array is tapped into the part of the brain, one of the parts of the brain important for controlling movement. It's connected by some fine wires to that pedestal. I'll show you that again in just a moment. And if everything works the way that we want it to, person in our trial who's unable to move their arms, unable to move their legs, will think about moving their hand, and they may be able to control the cursor on a computer screen or, or perhaps some other external technology. So uh, how do we uh, get this in the brain? Well, we make a quick hole in the skull, take a piece of bone away, put the array in place, put the piece of bone back, a little titanium, put the skin back, and we're done. Are there any neurosurgeons here, by the way? No, good, then I can get away with that. Oh, uh, yeah. oh well. The, um, uh, what's most important for this slide, though, is that the current state of the art today is that there's this array that's tapped into the top of the brain, connected by some fine wires to that pedestal that's sticking out through the skin. It's the same way that deep brain stimulators for movement disorders, as for Parkinson's disease, were developed, same way as cardiac pacemakers were originally developed with leads coming out of the chest, being pushed along on carts. It's about the stage that the technology is at uh, today, but I'll tell you about some progress being made. So uh, there have been 11 patients, people, participants in this ongoing BrainGate pilot clinical trial. Uh, three are engaged in the trial uh, today. Uh, these have been folks with uh, spinal cord injury, with ALS, that is Lou Gehrig's disease, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, or brainstem stroke. Uh, if I neglect to say it later, these are the true pioneers. These are people who will join us and have joined us in a pilot clinical trial, not because they're hoping to get any benefit themselves, but because they want to help us to develop and test a technology that we all hope will help other people with paralysis in the future. So let me tell you a little bit about our first participant in the trial. Uh, he's uh, sitting there, the, uh, and he's being plugged in to this uh, early BrainGate neural interface system. And what you're going to see, this is a gentleman who was about 24 when he was in the trial. When he was 21, he was breaking up a fight at a July 4th beach party, he was stabbed in the back of the neck, had what's known as the C4 Asia A spinal cord injury, he'd been unable to move his arms or his legs since then. About two years later, he joined us in the trial as the first participant, and uh, 
There he is plugged in. You see this cable. It's kind of temporarily during the recording sessions plugged into the pedestal. And uh, you'll hear his voice, somewhat soft. He's on a ventilator uh, along with one of our technicians, Abe Kaplan. And he's going to be controlling that cursor on the screen just by thinking about the movement of his own hand. OK, so here's the cyberkinetics desktop. What are you going to do first? I'm going to open my email first. OK. <laughs> first one. You can open the first one. So that neural cursor that he's using, and it's, he's it's, kind of, I'll let him read. Congratulations, you are doing a great he, job. He's dragging it Very across good. one of those icons, opening this simulated, in this Second case, email. email. OK. It says, hi, we will talk soon. Now, Great. since his injury, now, he had been unable to, to draw, and we wanted to see if we could Negative. restore that ability, at least briefly, to, uh, to draw. So uh, for those of you who ever used to use Mac Paint uh, back in the day, uh, we'll launch uh, an app that looks like that. Uh, there's an eraser at the top, an inkwell down at the bottom. This is the first attempt to try to draw a circle. Not quite. We'll give it another shot. Okay. All right, let's try it again. It wasn't no. a circle either, but the as Abe time. points out, he saw the obstacle and he avoided it. That's we asked him to do some other things for about eight minutes, and then we asked him to okay. come back to uh, try to draw the circle again. Going to draw a circle. All right. Excellent. No. Not bad. I'll try uh, going back so to the desktop. I'll show you some other virtual devices being very controlled, good. but uh, even very early on, we wanted to see if physical devices could be controlled. Uh, so uh, there in the lower left is a real prosthetic hand intended for somebody with transradial amputation. Uh, our participant, Matt, is going to say open and close so that we know what it is that he's trying to do with that hand. And depending on the audio, we may hear his response to uh, being able to do this. Close. Holy shit. Uh, I've seen that a lot, but it's still fun to see. But it's important to note that that's really very simple. It's not even one dimension of control. It's basically a state control, open or closed. So uh, from that early uh, condition, we want to continue to get better uh, at doing this. Uh, just to jump ahead a little bit, what can, else can we learn while we have this extraordinary opportunity to record, not just for weeks, but for months or years from the cortex of somebody with perhaps a neurodegenerative disease, such as ALS. Uh, we'll ask uh, Tony, who's ever got their hand on the audio dial, maybe to turn it down just a little bit. The, um, that is a picture of probably 50, maybe 60 or so individual neurons being recorded in the motor cortex of somebody with ALS. Advanced ALS is the gentleman who similarly had lost the ability to move. He had about a flicker of one finger on his right hand had lost some of his eye movements, was unable to speak, was mechanically ventilated. Uh, but here he is, as we record from his cortex in his living room, not in a university laboratory, trying to build this technology where we hope it will be useful and to test it, again, not in a controlled environment, but in somebody's living room or wherever they may live. Uh, and in the lower right-hand corner, you may see a little cursor floating around. On the very first day and the very first time that he tried to control uh, that cursor, he was able to do so with, uh, with some skill. So we can learn about the cortex. We can learn some fundamental human neuroscience that we would not have access to in any other way as we're developing these technologies. Let me come back now for a moment to the woman whose MRI you saw before. About nine years after that stroke, she had recovered a little bit. She had regained the ability to turn her head. She had regained use of her eyes. But she still had no functional use of her limbs. She was still unable to speak. So here. After she's enrolled in the trial, we're going to ask her to try to open and close her hand, which is something that she can't do. Close your hand. But you can look and listen to just Relax. a few neurons that we're recording at that moment. Open your hand. Relax. Just by listening, we can close all know what that neuron is trying to do. It's probably trying to do the exact same thing that it was doing before she had her stroke, which is to help open and close Relax. her hand. Uh, 
technical term for that is a pretty neuron. Uh, it's, we know what it does. They're not all that pretty, but thanks to all that uh, computational neuroscience, we can take an ensemble of neurons, we can take these varying action potentials and their firing patterns and begin to decode them for more complex control of external devices. This syndrome that she had, known as locked-in syndrome, unable to move, unable to speak, but awake and alert. Uh, same condition that Jean-Dominique Baudy, the editor of the French L, may have had, for those who read or saw the uh, Diving Bell and the Butterfly, a uh, very similar stroke. Uh, here, she's using the investigational brain gate system to point and click on this kind of MATLAB drawn up uh, keyboard. And uh, the message there, we had asked her before a conference a few years ago if there was a message she wanted to share with other people with paralysis. And she's pointing and clicking, again, just by thinking about the movement of her own hand. And uh, she's sharing uh, slowly, without a doubt, but fairly confidently, uh, quite an optimistic message, uh, which is one that I certainly share. After doing this, there are some other uh, opportunities, the, uh, which I'll show just uh, briefly. The, um, uh, she typed up on that MATLAB keyboard. We then performed what we believe at the time to have been the world's first, not that it matters at all, brain-computer interface Google Chat. And uh, there she was with the MATLAB keyboard, typing with uh, Sergei Stavisky, who was in the lab with us at the time, went out to be a grad student at Stanford, uh, where uh, I believe he will uh, soon be graduating within a year or so. I probably just cursed him to actually achieve that goal, so sorry, Sergey. But the, uh, he's sitting in the lab, and our participants G-chatting with him. And when she was able to do this, she said to us that she'd really like to be able to use the BrainGate system to G-chat with her adult children, including the son, that is, who was 10 years old, sitting next to her on the couch when she had had that stroke at this point about 12 years earlier. So the cursors that I've showed you so far been a little bit slow, a little bit wobbly, all kinds of acceptable reasons for it back then, but we need to continue to make this better. Uh, here just in Nature Medicine a couple of months ago, uh, Vikash uh, Gildred, Chetan Pandaranaf, uh, to our colleagues from the Multi-Institutional Brain Gate Collaboration out of Stanford, uh, two people with ALS, both controlling that white cursor, both trying to get to the target that's lit up uh, on the side, and you might get the sense that our math, if you will, is getting better. We're getting better and better at being able to decode these neural signals uh, for control of an external device, such as a cursor on a screen. And here's a different type of keyboard, uh, this, uh, known as a radial keyboard. The, uh, and here our participants are able to pick letters, one of the wedges from the pi, can bring then a word down. And you can kind of get the sense that not only are we building better interfaces that are more appropriate for somebody who has the equivalent of point and click control, not a full keyboard's worth of 10 fingers typing control, but point and click control over keyboard. And by the length of what they're typing, you may get the sense that we're being able to do this better and better, more and more stable. And I can tell you with less and less intervention, from somebody who has a PhD in neurophysiology who would otherwise be standing next to the system making sure that it works. Uh, that situation of having an expert te technician is not part of a future medical technology. And slowly pulling the people away and getting the technology to the point that it can run by itself so the user could use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week is undoubtedly one of our goals. There's one more virtual uh, Display. Here's a different type of keyboard, and yet again, there's another a woman with ALS who is, again, pointing and clicking or pointing and dwelling, depending on the sound. Uh, here, we've asked her to type that phrase that's up at the top. You must be the change you wish to see in the world, so we know exactly what it is that she's trying to type. And now, as shown at Society for Neuroscience uh, as an abstract just a few weeks ago, uh, hopefully you'll believe me when I say I think we're getting close to the point of typing speed being reasonable and being reasonable enough for somebody with a severe physical disability who otherwise has limited or no access to uh, what are typical ubiquitous communication technologies, iPads, phones, computers, to be able to communicate much more effectively and also to do, of course, the text speech that's, uh, that's really available. So uh, I've shown you quite a bit about virtual devices. Let's move back to physical devices. There's a woman in the red shirt, a woman whose stroke I showed you from an MRI. At this point, about 14 years earlier, five years 
prior to this video, she had had that chip, that is, that array of electrodes implanted in the brain. And here she's thinking about reaching out to grasp these targets that are being presented in front of her in a kind of typical workspace. And the targets look like little raspberry ice cream cones. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner is another gentleman with a similar stroke, locked in, he's 65 years old, no use of his limbs, unable to speak. But here he's using the DECA arm, one of the great prosthetic limbs that's been developed. The, uh, this is a second-generation limb, and you get the sense that they're able to get that arm just by thinking about moving their own arm cl pretty close to the target, still a little slow, certainly not perfect, uh, but getting better and better. And knowing that at least one person was able to do this for up to five years and even beyond five years suggests that maybe the technology has legs and maybe we're going to be able to record for long enough to develop a clinically useful technology. So we asked her, what did she want to do with this? brain gate device with the system, and she said that she wanted to take a drink. We said, okay. So uh, we filled what, uh, I'll tell you for scientific precision, was the thermos full of cinnamon latte. And she's thinking about bringing her arms in, kind of reaching that arm out to grab that thermos, and she's going to bring it close to her. Now, she still doesn't have the ability to move left or right or to move her trunk back or forth, so she has to line up that thermos right in front of her. So she's thinking about moving her dominant right arm to bring that, uh, that thermos close to her. And when she gets it lined up, it'll come in a little closer. And then when she gets there, she'll turn her wrist, or the, think about turning her wrist, and the robot wrist will turn to uh, be able to put that straw into her mouth. Now, the next 30 seconds or so has nothing to do with brain-computer interfaces or neurotechnologies and everything to do with her still profound disability. She has a reduced SIP capacity, that is negative inspiratory force, because of her, uh, because of her stroke. So it's going to take her a little while to move that straw around in her mouth. Uh, while she's doing that, I'll tell you that that's one of our engineers in the background, and he was under strict instruction to show no emotion. We'll move this around just a little bit more. And she'll take that sip. Now, I can assure you that's not the first time in nearly 15 years that she's had something to drink. Um, but it is the first time in nearly 15 years that she was able to do so solely of her own volition. So she puts that thermos down, you can tell she's happy, we're happy, that guy's fired. <laughs> yeah. So uh, where do we hope this technology is going? It's still early, for sure. I've shown you a device that's got a little piece of titanium sticking up through the head. That's not a future medical technology, it's the way a lot of others started. Uh, but we are making great progress, progress in developing a fully implantable technology. First stage of that is my, in my pocket, which will get rid of the cable that's currently tethering our participants to the card of computers that's decoding the neural activity. Thanks to Professor Arthur Namiko at, uh, at Brown University, we will soon be able to uh, telemeterize all of this high bandwidth, full bandwidth neural activity, uh, untethering our participants. And we hope that within a few years, this will be a fully implanted system, uh, as it has been already in animals and uh, in early testing. Uh, beyond that neuroengineering, we're hoping to develop better communication platforms for people with locked-in syndrome or other forms of physical disability, better assistive devices, better control over robotic or prosthetic limbs. And together with our close colleagues at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, who are experts in functional electrical stimulation, we're trying to marry these two technologies of brain recording, these intuitive signals, rooted down to stimulation technologies that have been around for 30 years, so that somebody with a brainstem stroke like her or a spinal cord injury might one day be able to reach out pick up that coffee cup again uh, with their own limb. There's still a lot more work to do. There's a lot more research to do. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested in learning about some of the many challenges that we still have in getting this technology from where it is today to being one that's been discussed here many times that eventually does need to make it to market. We need to get this to the people who need them. I'm on a personal mission. I want to make locked-in syndrome go away. I do not want to see another patient in our neurointensive care unit who can't move and can't speak, who's awake and alert. And if I do, I want to be able to tell them, 
I'm really sorry that happened, but you'll be communicating tomorrow. And this type of system, representative of the field that's focused on this, should be able to achieve that goal, and I hope it's not too many years away. This is some of the team, hard at work, as you can tell, it's dedicated to this. Thanks very much.